If I were to make a top five of the most well-known and arguably the most important passages of Scripture in the entire Bible, this passage that we're going to be talking about this morning and the next ten weeks would definitely make that list. It would rank up there with Psalm 23, which I don't think I've ever been to a funeral without Psalm 23 uh, being quoted. It would rank up there with the Sermon on the Mount, which... Most of us don't have the Sermon on the Mount memorized because it's three chapters long, but we all know bits and pieces from it and quote it regularly. Or how about 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, which I've never been to a Christian uh, wedding and not have that chapter quoted. Or even John 3.16. You know, that probably uh, round out the top five passages of Scripture that most people know. Yet I wonder how many of us actually know all the Ten Commandments. Who can quote them by heart? Who thinks they can do it? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because uh, I don't want people bragging if they know it, okay? But, uh, you know, how many of you can do it in order? That's even harder. I can't. I always get the last two or three confused, right? Like, which one comes first? Thou shalt not bear false witness or thou shalt not steal. I always get those mixed up. And uh, it's even made uh, more famous because of the widely known phrasing of the King James with its phrase, thou shalt not. How many times have we said something, even to our kids, thou shalt not take another cookie, right? We know that phrase because we know the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments are that important to our society. As well known as the Ten Commandments are, however, I doubt we could ever outdo the importance that God places on these first ten laws. Now, we've been talking about the Jews walking through the desert, leaving Egypt, and and there's a buildup to the reveal of the Ten Commandments. This buildup is is really important. In fact, it takes uh, place over Exodus chapter 18 and Exodus chapter 19. So if if you have a Bible this morning, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20. I'm just going to summarize the other two chapters for you. After the incident with the manna from heaven, which we talked about last week, the Israelites set up camp at Rephidim. Moses struck the rock and water poured out, and that was a a miraculous event. God provided for the nation of Israel once more. He provided meat. He provided bread. He provided water. And then after that, they defeated Amalek with the sword. And Amalek was a leader of a small tribe, a small army, and this, they stood in the way of uh, the nation of Israel, and God led them into victory. And that was the first victory that they had since they left Egypt, first victory in battle, that is. And then they settle in a bit, and they wait on the move of God. As they waited, though, there were thousands of people lining up, asking Moses for legal advice, and pleading with him to solve every dispute. Now imagine that we don't have judges that could do that. Imagine there was just one man in the entire county, and he had to hear every single dispute, not just the major ones, not just the the major criminal criminal acts, but every traffic dispute, everything that we have uh, uh, that, that goes on in the county every single day. Do you think that one person could handle it? Well, imagine being Moses with 2.5 million people and all the disputes and and the arguments that he had to settle. And they were coming to him, lining up every single day, and he was having to go through case by case trying to solve their problems. This was very taxing on Moses, uh, his time and his energy, so much so that Jethro, his father-in-law, stepped in. And he said, Moses, you can't keep this up. You're going to burn yourself out. (coughs) <coughs> so what he told Moses to do is he said, go into the, the camp and find men that are qualified, holy men, men that, that are wise, men that, know, uh, that are known for their good reputation, and, and select them out to be elders, to be judges and rulers over the people. And you're going to divide the people up in hundreds and even in tens, and you're going to assign these men to those people so that you don't have to do all this extra work yourself. It actually reminds me of how the deacon ministry got started. 
in a similar way in the book of Acts, right? There was a need in the church, and the, the disciples couldn't handle it all, so they appointed men. There's no doubt in my mind that they had this in the back of their head as a, a blueprint of how to do ministry. So Moses does that. But you could tell there's something missing, isn't there? Almost like they, if they had a law that they could pass that showed us what we should and shouldn't be doing, and we could just point to the law, right? Then on the third month, the third new moon, after they left Egypt, they finally approached Mount Sinai. Now God understood the significance of what was about to happen. He was going to renew his covenant with Israel and then further expand upon it. This covenant would include the introduction of the law of God. God saw the way the people were treating each other and they were drowning in their grievances against each other. God knew that they needed law. They needed it. There was no way around it. They were going to need a written law to follow. God expanding his covenant, though, didn't happen just because Israel was special. You may say, aren't they the chosen ones? Yes, they are. But God's covenant wasn't based on who the people of Israel were. If it was, we'd be in trouble. It was because Israel was to be a light to the other nations. God selected Israel, which if you think about where Israel is located, it's in the middle of the, of the entire world, right? Especially the known world at that time. They were the center point. They were the, the uh, centerpiece of God and his ministry and what he was doing on earth. And they had a mission. That covenant relationship came with it, a challenge to be a light to the nations. Exodus scholar Douglas Stewart said it this way, they were not to be a people unto themselves, enjoying as, uh, their special relationship with God and paying no attention to the rest of the world. Rather, they were to represent him in the rest of the world and attempt to bring the rest of the world to him. The challenge was to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You will be a blessing, as it says in Genesis. I will bless those who bless you, and all the peoples on the earth will be a blessing, will be blessed through you. This was the covenant that he made to Abraham. And God was going to renew it and expand upon it. God was going to reveal himself to the people of Israel. This moment was a monumental moment. The people had to be ready to meet with God because this was an incredibly serious and sacred moment. They had to consecrate themselves beforehand. That meant washing all your garments and abstaining from sexual relations for at least 24 hours. They were also to stay away from the mountain until God called them up. Anyone who touched the mountain or even came near it or crossed over it with their foot was to be stoned to death. That's how serious God treated this moment. And then God appears to the whole camp as a fire. Fire came down from the heavens and engulfed Mount Sinai. And there was smoke all around the mountain. He comes to them as a fire to hide his full glory. He cannot reveal himself in his full glory because if he did, I believe it would have killed everybody instantly. So with a loud trumpet blast, God signals the camp to draw near. And he speaks to Moses. When he does, the camp only hears thunder and the trumpet. And the Bible says the trumpet gets louder every time he speaks. The thunder gets louder. There's a lightning flashing in the sky. Can you imagine what that was like? You're at the base of this mountain. And it's, in, uh, it's just engulfed in smoke and fire. <coughs> and there's lightning in the, in the smoke. And you hear this trumpet blast. be pretty frightening, wouldn't it? This was a very, very serious moment. God then says to Moses, go down and get Aaron and bring him up to the top of the mountain. Reading in verse 1 in chapter 20, God begins to speak to Moses and says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The Ten Commandments start off with arguably the most important commandment of the Ten. You shall have no other gods before me. And he gives you the reason why. Because he brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He did that. Asherah did not do that. 
Baal did not do that. Set did not do that. None of the 30,000 or 30 million or how many ever Egyptian gods there are, they didn't do that because they're pretend. They're made up. They're, they're uh, figments of a vain imagination. God, Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, is the only true God, and he delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. The structure of the commandment itself is very simple, as most of the commandments are. You shall have no other gods before me. Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. No getting around it. Now, the word before sometimes, though, is translated besides. So you may have in your version, uh, you shall have no other god besides me. As the word in Hebrew can have both meanings, it's translated both ways. But the meaning is still the same. You are not to prefer, entertain the presence of, believe in, or worship any God besides Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. This commandment is the one that is actually, believe it or not, it's based on love. Our devotion to the Lord is not one of duty or obligation, although those are important, but it's one born out of love because God first loved us. Now, follow me here in my logic, okay, because I'm going to land this plane, I promise you. The first four commandments have a theme. Okay, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Notice the theme here. What do these four first commandments have to do with? What do they, what, what do they deal with? They Our relationship with God. Our relationship with God. They are vertical in uh, our understanding and in our orientation. And God does come first. Okay, so let's look at the next six. Honor your father and mother. You shall, not mur uh, 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 you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. What is the theme here? It's all about how we treat each other, right? So you have vertical commandments, or the first four, and then you have horizontal commandments, which have to do with how we treat each other. So when Jesus said... Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. He said that was the greatest commandment. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What he meant by that when he said that was that this was a summary of the law of God. There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments are a summary of all of those laws and Jesus' statement of the two greatest commandments that we have to love the Lord our, uh, our God and to love our neighbor is a summary of those Ten Commandments. So really, what is a summary of all the law of God? Love, right? Love. Love your, the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Again, follow me here. The motivation for following the Ten Commandments is not obedience. It's love. That's the motivation. Jesus makes it clear in John 15. He says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Oh, but love shouldn't be based on rules, Pastor Nathan, right? Love is just an emotion. It's just a, a whimsical thing. It's, it's this ethereal cloud that's out there that we, that we don't have any form or any boundaries. Love knows no boundaries, right? That, you've heard that before. I'm sure there's a country song or two that has to do with that. But this isn't a country song. This is real life. You can't love someone without committing to them, and you can't commit to them without expectations. How do I prove that I love my wife? I said I love her. The, the day I proposed to you, I said I love you. Remember that? It was the first time I told you that. I said it, and I meant it then. But how do I prove that I love my wife? I commit to her. That means expectations. That means rules to follow. You can call it whatever you want, but you have expectations or boundaries or rules or commandments or whatever. You have to follow, to have and to hold, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Now imagine if I said to my wife, I love you, and then went and did whatever I wanted all the time. Would I really love my wife? Stayed out late, hung around with other women, treated her like trash, Oh, but I said I love you that one time, and I meant it. 
No, we have to prove our love. This is why marriage was created by God. It is actually to reflect what our relationship with God should really be like. It's sometimes imperfect, even though God created it perfectly. We made it imperfect, but it is a reflection of our relationship with, with God. Remember what God told uh, Hosea to do? Remember that story? I've talked about this before. Just this little story in the middle of the Old Testament about this prophet. And God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute. Now, did that prostitute remain faithful to Hosea? Well, <laughs> it's in the name prostitute, right? No. She didn't. She cheated on him many times. And God used that as a setup to show Israel what they were doing to his covenant relationship with him at that time. This is what he told Israel through the prophet Hosea. Listen to these words because they reflect how our, uh, following the commandments is actually an act of love. Hear the word of the Lord, O uh, children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the peoples. For you have played the whore, forsaking your God. When Israel violates the law of God, God compares them to a prostitute because they started worshiping other gods. They have abandoned their love for God. So, when we violate one of these commandments, we are not violating some arbitrary moral code that's out there that some people think the Ten Commandments are. And they do believe that. They do teach that. They think that. They think that they're just a list of rules that anybody can come up with for any reason. It's arbitrary to them. But it's not arbitrary because it's tied to the character and nature of God. It's an outpouring of his nature to us and who he is. So when we violate one of these commandments, we are violating our love relationship with the, with the creator. This is why I believe the commandment, this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, is the first one. Because from it, all the other commandments flow. If we get this one wrong, the rest follows suit. And if we do follow this commandment, the rest of the commandments will also fall in mind. If we follow the first commandment perfectly, the rest of them will be a walk in the park be cake because we have oriented ourselves correctly with God and we have a right relationship with him but let's face it that has never happened except when Jesus Christ did it so when the first commandment falls the rest fall with it like dominoes but pastor if we're incapable of fulfilling the law ourselves then what is the point of following them well, the point isn't trying to fulfill the law yourself. You can't do that any more than you can save yourself. And you cannot save yourself. If you cannot follow the law of God perfectly, you're condemned. It's impossible for you to save yourself. The purpose of the law of God was threefold. And I want you to, to uh, think about this and really pay attention to it. Because I'm going to refer back to it in the coming weeks. Number one is to show the awful sinfulness of humans and their moral stance from God. To demonstrate humanity's need for a mediator between God and us. And finally, to show how humans could live more abundantly by using the law as their guide to daily living. The first point shows us what is broken in our world. We do not have a relationship with God because we have violated his law. Romans 3.10 and following uh, sum it up nicely. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is what God thinks of us before we accept the shed blood of Jesus. We are who we really are, which is unrepentant, unforgiving, uncaring, low-down, dirty, ugly sinners. And the purity of his holiness, of God's holiness, uh, of his glory, demands that he cannot be in the presence of sin. Isaiah 59.2 says it this way, but your iniquities, which means your sinless 
your sinfulness, your lawlessness have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The law we broke also broke our relationship with God. And now we need somebody to step in who is worthy and commend that relationship that can rebuild that bridge between God and us. And of course, that person is Jesus Christ. Christ, who kept the law perfectly, although he was found guilty of breaking it, falsely accused thereof. Christ, who knew the law better than all the teachers in Israel. Christ, who did not need anyone to die for him because he kept the law perfectly, yet he still died for the world. That Christ is our mediator between us and the Father. The purpose of the law is to show this awful sinfulness of humans and their moral distance from God to de demonstrate humanity's need for a mediator between God and us, and lastly, to show how humans could live more abundantly by using the law as their guide to daily living. And to that last part, I just want to say, we leave so much on the table, and we miss out on so much of what God can show us when we don't obey his law. We miss out on so much of life and what life has for us by turning our back on God or just trying to do our own thing. Every decision we make, every attitude, and every emotion all points back to the law of God. And we have a responsibility to being salt and light in this world, and that means following God's commandment. And even thanksgiving points to the first commandment. Even Thanksgiving, the coming holiday. Last week, we talked about how when you grumble and complain, you're not just grumbling against an inanimate object, but against a person, right? Remember that? And you are not just grumbling against a human, but also against God. Well, the same is true with giving thanks. You can't thank nature for producing a harvest. That wouldn't make any sense. I guess you could take a walk, Vaughn. You could take a walk into the woods and, and stare at a tree and thank a tree for producing its fruit. Or maybe go up to a, a cow and thank a cow for, for producing its milk. But that wouldn't make any sense, would it? You could and should be thankful for your family. They do provide for you, but they're not the ultimate provider. Ultimately, there is one more person in the room that you should be thanking, and that's God. This Thanksgiving, I believe, 100% is a Christian holiday. What do I mean by that? I would mean that outside of Jesus Christ, outside of God, it doesn't make any sense. The holiday is nonsensical. And I will argue that to an atheist, to his face. I have, actually. Because I believe that strongly. There is only one reason to give thanks, and that's because we have an ultimate provider that we can be thankful for. By showing God your gratitude, you are orienting yourself correctly with God. He is your provider. From him spring forth all of creation and all of the good things that you have in your life. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Okay, verse 19. Everybody turn there. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. To not feel gratitude towards God, to not be thankful it leads to a world of hurt, a world of suffering, and a world that's ruled by sin. We're going to read the first few verses, starting in verse 19, and then we're going to skip down to verse 28. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his inv invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they, came, they, they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. 
though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, do you see the downward spiral that sin takes you? Right? It's like a, a whirlpool. In the middle of the whirlpool is a cesspool of sin. And it doesn't start off that bad, but it ends up pretty bad. The further you get away from God, the deeper you are into sin and into lawlessness, into iniquity, and into darkness. And that downward spiral is very real. I think everybody in here knows somebody who has followed that path. They live a dark life. Where does it start? Where does that spiral start? By not honoring God and not giving thanks to him. That's where it starts. When you keep in your mind all the things that God did for Israel, all right, and how often they complained and stabbed him in the back, you start to see why God would only tolerate so much before he finally says, okay, have it your way. Wallow in your sin. I'm done with you. I have given you over to your depraved mind. And now you're past the point of no return. Now, when it comes to this passage in Romans 1, I think it's talking about the world. Obviously it is. Because Christians who follow Jesus Christ, who have the Holy Spirit, will listen to the Holy Spirit's warning and turn back around. They're not going to follow that path. They're just not. They will always heed God's warning. But the world doesn't. The world goes, to, goes there. The world doesn't mind wallowing in sin. We as believers need to uh, live differently than the world. See, when we come to Christ, when we bow our knee to him, when we show him that, uh, that we're ready to start living the way God told us to live, that means that's our way of finally admitting that we've broken that first commandment. That we have sinned against God. That we have no longer honored him but follow other gods. Maybe those gods are, are American gods like materialism or, or secularism or atheism. But we have decided that we are not going to follow that path anymore. And uh, we submit to Christ as our first step in restoring a right, right relationship with him. But we also need to follow what Jesus said. If you love him, keep his commandments. The commandments are not restrictions designed to hold you back from enjoying your life or reaching its fullest potential. The commandments, the commandments actually set you free to do God's will without fear. When you are protected from sin, you are free. As Jesus said, when the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. The law of God for believers, for unbelievers rather, condemns them. But for us, as believers following Jesus Christ, for us, it is beautiful. It is life-giving. It gives us our freedom that we need to serve God. Listen to what it says in uh, Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it with, uh, according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you. Let my, not my heart uh, wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Now, does that sound drab and boring? Does that sound like some restrictive life? with lots of boundaries and rules designed to hold the man down? Does that sound oppressive to you? I don't know about you, but that sounds wonderful to me. That sounds like the kind of life that I want to live. Do you long to have a relationship with God like that? Do you so hope your life can be filled with that kind of meaning and purpose? Wouldn't you love to think of God's word and his commandments like the psalmist does? Well, if you do, then start by being thankful for what God has given you. Yesterday I was talking to a man, we were talking about Thanksgiving and talking about plans and stuff. And he said, uh, he said, I, I don't really enjoy being with my family. I, I go because I know it's the right thing to do. But all they do is grumble and complain. That's all they do. And if they're not grumbling and complaining, they're bragging about how 
good of a year they had and how much more money they made than me. And that's all it is. It's just this weird mixture of grumbling and complaining and then trying to outdo each other and one-up each other. And he kind of went on and on for a little bit, and I, I just thought to myself, you know, we as Christians, we're going to be interacting with people that do not think this way. They have also violated the law of God, but the difference is they have not submitted their heart to Jesus Christ. Their orientation with God is not correct. And so, of course, they're going to see life like that. Of course, they're going to live like that. And of course, they're going to talk like that. That's why we need to be salt. That's why we need to be light. We salt our words with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with his love and with his precepts, his commandments. We do so in love for those people. It's going to be tough for some people to, to be around family because of that this Thanksgiving. But we're commanded to be salt and light. So my challenge to you, congregation, this week is just be careful how you talk to your family. You know, know that they don't have the grace of God in their life, or, or maybe they do. Maybe they are Christians, but still, let's rejoice in what God has given us. He's given us this bounty. He's given us this harvest. Let's rejoice in it together. Let's make this Thanksgiving one that we can say that we are a light to the nations. We're the ones fulfilling the commandments the way they're supposed to be fulfilled. Amen? Start by being th thankful for what God has given you. Connie, come on up here. We're going to sing this song, My Tribute. Of course, I always known it growing up as To God Be the Glory. To God Be the Glory. For what? For the great things He has done. It's already there. It's built into the song that we are to be thankful and what I like about this is it says to give God glory. That orients ourselves underneath that first commandment the way we're supposed to be oriented. You shall, not have, you shall have no other gods before me. Why? Because God has delivered us. And he's given us every good thing that we have in our life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we humbly admit that we are just not grateful. We are a nation of ungrateful people that have left our first love, that have not understood or acknowledged everything you've done for us. But Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, we at least made that first step to acknowledge who you are. And now we get the, the same mission, same, same mission that Israel had, same mission to be a light to the nations, we have as our beacon the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, let it pour through us and shine through us in our actions, in our words, and our thoughts this week. In Jesus' name.